My name is Nicholas Zeb. I am a Chinese and Western herbalist. I own a company called Grey Mountain Herbs. It's located in Provo. Um, I have a small apothecary with about 200 herbs that I stock, uh, both Western, Chinese, and Ayurvedic herbs. Um, I also teach classes occasionally when I'm um, not too crazy busy doing a million other things. And I also have a small clinical practice um, where I use different herbs to treat people. Um, I primarily use a Chinese system of diagnosis. Um, and so I will tell you a lot of things that you'll probably just look at me confused. But you'll take the herbs and they will definitely help. Um, just kind of a little bit about me and kind of my background. Um, I started studying herbal medicine about 18 years ago uh, when I quit taking pharmaceutical drugs and uh, just kind of got interested in herbs because I knew at some point I was going to need to be able to heal myself. And so I um, started out there just reading some books, kind of some independent self-study and then um, in 99, 2000, um, I decided that I wanted to kind of commit my life to herbs and so that's when I became an herbalist or started down the herbal path, so to speak. Um, and that was just followed by a lot more, more intense independent study. I volunteered and internship at a few uh, medicinal herb farms in Oregon um, and then in 2006, 2005 uh, began school at the Appalachian School of Holistic Herbalism which is based in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, did a year and a half long program there just in traditional Western herbalism. And then in 2009, I broke my neck and moved back to Utah. And uh, from there, at that point on, I um, started studying Chinese herbalism. I kind of did it quite a bit. I was uh, general manager of an acupuncture distribution company uh, in North Carolina. So I had a pretty good year long crash course, year and a half long crash course in uh, Chinese herbs through that, um, and acupuncture as well, but I don't just practice acupuncture. Um, and then came out here and did a two year long, two and a half year long uh, internship and herbal program from the Institute of Chinese Herbalism, uh, which they're based out of California. And I am an advanced Chinese herbalist. Um, and then I'm also, Currently studying uh, aromatherapy, I'm just getting ready to finish up my aromatherapy certification, and I am also very interested in Ayurvedic medicine, uh, which is herbalism from India, basically. And so today, I figured I would just kind of talk about uh, different culinary herbs that we can all find in our kitchen. Um, you know, just things that are readily available to pretty much everybody on a daily basis, um, and so. With that, I will kind of just jump right in. This is actually um, a class that I teach pretty regularly. Um, so if you're interested in going a little more in depth, my full class is two hours long. Um, so I am cutting out a lot of the extra things. I'm not going to talk so much about the different Chinese and Ayurvedic uh, energetics and uses for the different herbs that I'll talk about today. Um, that's kind of getting more of what I would do in the full length of class. And, um, and then I also, in the full length class, I give away recipes and um, different uh, methods to prepare a lot of the different herbs that I'll talk about. Um, so, a lot of these are um, spices. They're not just herbs, but a lot of them are spices as well. Or what we would consider spices. And does anybody really kind of understand, like, know why? Um, we started using spices to begin with, I mean, long time ago. Go ahead. The Chinese always used various different herbs. Yeah. Like, for instance, they used to use um, spices to make spices than 10,000 herbs in the Chinese pharmacopoeia, wow. which is insane. I am familiar with maybe about 600. <laughs> I'm not going to go into that, into that today. But herbs, or spices and herbs, specifically started as a way to preserve our foods, um, and then also as a flavoring agent, you know, as kind of something that came about later on. And so, the great thing about all these herbs is the best way to take them 
is to just cook with them. And so there are things that are just readily available in our kitchens, but they also have these really great medicinal benefits that if you know how to use them properly, and if you cook with them regularly, it's gonna boost your immune system, it's gonna boost your health. You're gonna be like this lovely young lady here, 95 years young, going strong, you know? And so these are all really, really good herbs to know about and herbs to utilize on a daily basis. Um, so firstly, I kind of want to talk about ginger, um, which is a great herb. Everybody should eat ginger every day. Um, it's uh, botanical name is Zingiber officinal, or Zingiber officinal. It's in the Zingiberaceae family, so it's got its own family. Um, and ginger is native to India, but it's also, at this point, it's cultivated throughout the tropical regions. Um, it's, uh, in Europe, they thought, they, in the Middle Ages, they viewed ginger to have, was one of the original plants of the Garden of Eden, or kind of the church and the mindset of, at the time, was that was, because it's such a strong and useful medicinal for so many different reasons, so many different purposes, that, um, you know, they valued that highly that they thought that it came out of the Garden of Eden. Um, it's also highly revered all throughout Asia. It's uh, in India. It's known as the universal uh, plant because it is, has so many different uses. Um, one of the things, and this is kind of going out of my notes, that I would talk about in my full class is that um, in in India, things that are really important in Hindi, they give them multiple names, and ginger has over forty names, forty different names in Hindi and Sanskrit. And so that just kind of goes to show how important this word is um, to Indians. So kind of looking at it from the scientific point, the constituents within uh, ginger that are useful to us are volatile oils, uh, there's starches and mucilage, um, uh, oleo resins, and uh, also ginger is really high in melatonin, which is a, a natural occurring hormone in our bodies um, that helps boost the immunity, um, it helps with sleep patterns, helps mind, um, and it's also a very, it's one of the best scavengers for the hydroxide ion, which is produced through um, kind of basically when we run out of glucose, our body starts converting sugars and fats into energy, and one of the byproducts of that is uh, hydroxide ion or also uh, hydrogen peroxide. So some of that action. Another good thing is if people get sick when they fly, they yeah. really sick. Yep. They yeah, and I'll... Well, oh, you're going to come. Yep, I'll come to you. So. Yeah, and if any of you have any questions or if you kind of want to me to clarify or define any terms or anything like that, definitely just interrupt me. But. Um, you know, I'll kind of just go through these different herbs. I'm going to cover about 12 herbs. And then at the end, you can throw out any wild questions you want, and hopefully I'll be able to answer them. Um, so some of the, the, uh, the key actions that we want to look at when we're looking at ginger are, um, first of all, it's a great anti-emetic. So it's going to cause, or it's going to help um, with travel, you know, motion sickness, travel sickness, all those kind of things. Um, it's also carminative, which means that it uh, reduces gas and bloating. Um, it's a circulatory stimulant. It inhibits coughing. Uh, it has analgesic properties or painkiller properties. It's antifungal, antiviral, anti-inflammatory. It's a diaphoretic, expectorant, antioxidant. The list goes on and on and on. Um, so it's, again, it's like ginger should really be in everybody's refrigerator, um, the fresh ginger, and then also dried ginger. And again, in the full class, I kind of go into the differences between fresh and dried ginger. They are used differently in a lot of cases. Benefits similar, or do you get more benefit out of one or the other? Um, so it, it depends kind of on what you're going for. The dry ginger is more heating, uh, so it's going to have more of a stimulating uh, action, whereas the fresh ginger um, is more, it's, it's still heating and it's still stimulating, but it's not quite as intense. Um, so that's kind of 
kind of. So is that all ginger? When you speak of ginger, you're speaking of what, what kind of ginger are you speaking of? Uh, Zingiber officinal. So, yeah, real authentic ginger. In Hawaii, you have the ginger that grows in the roots. Is that the same kind of ginger? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, so um, kind of some of the indications. Again, we have travel and motion sickness. You can make ginger candy. Um, it's really good for that. Post-operative nausea is really good. Um, in China, they treat a lot of the herbs that they use uh, with ginger juice. And what it does is it lowers the toxicity of some of the herbs that are um, completely poisonous. And by treating them with ginger juice, you can make them less toxic and make them uh, bioavailable uh, when you take herbs. It's also great for food poisoning. Um, morning sickness, indigestion, uh, can reduce high blood pressure, uh, increases circulation, so it's good for poor circulation. Um, and it also has a really great, really strong anti-inflammatory properties, so a lot of people use it for uh, arthritic conditions, um, any of those kind of conditions that are cold in nature, and you want to warm them up. Um, different preparations that we use a lot of the time with ginger are uh, the essential oil is really good for treating, uh, again, nausea, uh, digestive issues. It's very warming and very grounding. Um, fresh ginger is great for indigestion, nausea, colds, coughing, uh, food poisoning, and diaphoresis, which uh, diaphoresis is sweat inducing. So it helps kind of, you know, if you need to break a sweat, kind of get rid of that, you know, kind of colds and flus and things like that, kind of get that going. Uh, dry is, uh, it increases digestive fire. Um, it's stronger stimulant, but it's also great expectorant, um, which is to help you kind of produce mucus to get things out of your lungs. Um, it's uh, an oil, you can master it into an oil, like olive oil. Um, use that topically for sore muscles. Um, again, it just brings blood to the surface and increases the circulation. So all those things will kind of help I'm sorry, I had to step up for a phone call. What, what are we talking about? We're still talking about ginger. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then also as a powder, uh, you can take it as a pill, as a drop, which is just mixing the powder into the water. Um, it's great to put in the cookies, and ginger snaps, one of my all-time favorite cookies. Um, and then you can also take it as a decoction or take the root and cook it down into a strong tea. Um, so, Next, we'll talk about a relative of ginger, which is turmeric. Um, its botanical name is Curcuma longa, and it's also in the Zingiberaceae family. Um, this is another very highly used, really important herb in um, both Ayurvedic medicine and Chinese medicine. Um, it has, again, multiple names in Hindi and in Sanskrit. Uh, a couple of different preparations and uses in uh, traditional Chinese medicine. Um, it's also native to India and Southeastern Asia. Uh, it's again cultivated in um, kind of loose draining soils um, and it's propagated by the rhizome. Same with uh, ginger. You can just take cuttings, plant them. You can you actually even grow them across the room. Um, it doesn't necessarily get huge. Um, but I guess if you're really good and you have a nice warm window, give it plenty of water and humidity, it'll be fine. Um, it's common in curries, it's what gives curry its yellow color. Um, it's also been used as dyes in the past. Um, so its kind of constituents are, again, you know, just the volatile oils, um, zingiberin, tuberone, or some of the volatile oils that we can get from there. Uh, Curcuminoids, which are the kind of the scientifically evaluated aspect of um, turmeric and it also has again mucilage and oleo resins um, that are also beneficial and have been looked at you know kind of from the sci through a scientific lens. Um, its actions, it's a strong hepatic so it's a good liver cleanser, um, a colodon so it produces bile. It also has antibacterial, antifungal, um, antiviral properties. It's, again, another really potent antioxidant. Uh, it's also an analgesic, so again, pain relieving, uh, anti-inflammatory, 
Um, in some scientific studies, they found that it was actually stronger than um, hydrocortisone, had a stronger anti-inflammatory action, excuse me, on hydrocortisone. Um, and then it's also a certain kind of stimulant. So it's going to kind of stimulate the circulation. Some of its uh, key uses are for abdominal pain. Um, arthritis is a really, it's a really great herb for arthritis. It will also lower cholesterol. It's a cancer preventative. Um, it can reduce the risk of stroke and heart attack. Uh, and then also topically, it's topically it's really good for uh, psoriasis and fungal infections. Um, athletes uh, can be used for that. Um, and so then some different preparations of turmeric that are really commonly used are um, just again as a powder. You can roll them up with honey and make a honey pills, um, which then you can take internally. Um, you can take it as a draw again, just mixing the powder in the water and just kind of chugging it down. Um, a poultice uh, makes a great poultice where you just kind of mix it with some water or some kind of liquid and apply it directly to the skin. Um, it'll turn your skin yellow, but it doesn't like yellow skin. No. Uh, uh, and then also, you can also take it as a uh, decoction, um, it's where again you cook it down, uh, drink it as a tea, that's how it's prepared primarily in traditional Chinese medicine. Um, as a tincture, it will treat gut, yeah, excuse me, it will treat gastritis, gastritis, <laughs> I'll get it right, it's at some point. Um, and then there, it also you can get, um, it, in a lot of patented formulations, um, you can buy, you know, a million different turmeric preparations from the health food store uh, that are usually um, standardized curcumin and um, um, a lot of my medicinal herbs, um, it kind of depends on which, if I'm buying Ayurvedic, Chinese, or Western. Um, one good source that I trust and value is Mountain Herbs. Where is it? Mountain Rose Herbs. They're an online company. You can find them online. Um, they're based out of Oregon. They do only um, organic and certified wildcrafted herbs. Um, as far, it kind of depends on what I'm using it for. Uh, all of these herbs, again, like, I really want to stress just cook with them. Put them in your food all day long, every day, you know. Um, not only is it going to make your food taste better, it will help preserve your food, which then, again, it helps preserve you, you know. Um, it's going to boost your immune system, so that's, I feel that's the best way to get, especially these herbs. Um, if you have, you know, real severe arthritis or advanced rheumatoid arthritis, something maybe, I, at that point, I might recommend, you know, a standardized extract of curcumin or the dark curcumin leaves, um, just because you, it's e the amount of curcumin that you're getting, you know, in one of those like uh, super critical CO2 extracts, which leave no solvents behind, um, which are really good. Those are really good for just getting a ton of it all at once. You know, it's, Yeah. So if there's a way you can supply or light this mountain of herbs to order pounds of it, yeah. that would be wonderful. And I, I also sell um, all of these herbs that I talked about today, I'll, I could sell all of them as well okay. out of my apothecary. So that's a lot of the time might be easier than waiting, you know, a couple of weeks while you order it and wait for it to get shipped and anything like that. And I sell all my stuff at wholesale. Um, so it's cheaper than you know you buy it in the store. So. Um, so that brings us to another really great herb that I'm sure all of you are familiar with. Hang on one second, I need to drink some tea, always. Drink tea all day long. It's great. Um, it is garlic, uh, which is Allium sativa. It's in the lily family, or lily ACA. Um, and 
This is cultivated, again, it's native to India and Southern Asia, but it is now cultivated worldwide. Um, a lot of times it's planted in the fall and then you harvest it in fall and spring. Um, kind of when the leaves begin to brown. It's really good and you told me your name earlier. You just did the pie walk. Caleb. Caleb. Um, Caleb, I'm sure, knows this and can probably tell you more about it. But one thing that I love to do is the skates, which are the, the top part of garlic. Um, you can pickle them, just naturally pickle them, and they are amazing. So good. Really great way to get garlic. Um, so kind of the constituents that we're interested in with garlic are, again, you have volatile oils, alanin, alanase, allicin. Um, again, it's really high in mucilage content. Um, garlic has organic, organosulfuric compounds which kind of give it that real pungency flavor that you, we notice when we're eating garlic and why we smell like garlic for usually at least a few hours if not days after. Um, garlic is also really high in selenium, which is a, a trace mineral that we all need in order to maintain healthy tissues and our bodies. Uh, it's also high in vitamins A, B, C, and E. Um, so it's a good source of these vitamins that you know, if you're not eating a balanced, healthy diet that sometimes we need. So some of the great actions, or some of the key actions with garlic are, it's uh, antimicrobial, is an expectorant, so it increases lung secretions. Uh, it's diaphoretic, so again, it kind of reduces that sweating, uh, which if you're eating a lot of garlic, may not be the greatest thing, because then you're gonna smell like garlic. Um, it also has some anti-diabetic properties that um, they're just starting to kind of evaluate through scientific um, studies. It can reduce blood pressure. Um, it also can reduce blood clots uh, by preventing platelet aggregation, so it kind of keeps the, the clotting factor blood from working to combine uh, together to form clots, um, which can, if you're taking Coumarin or other blood thinners, it is something that you kind of want to maybe pay attention to. Um, you're fine to eat it as a normal dose, but if you start taking lots of garlic supplements or taking garlic pills, things like that, if you're getting really high doses, it's just something to be aware of that it can cause blood cleaning. Um, so again, if you're taking kind of those black thinners, you just want to be aware of that. Um, and it's also a verb here, so you can use it to expel worms, intestinal parasites, and things like that. Um, so some of the key uses um, are uh, to lower elevated blood lipid levels, so triglycerides, if you eat a lot of fatty foods, garlic is really good at kind of helping our body process a lot of those. Um, Arterial sclerosis, um, so you know, build up a plaque um, over the years of eating, you know, our standard American diet is terrible, you know, for hardening of the arteries, building a plaque. Um, it's also shown some, uh, in different clinical studies, it's shown some uh, benefit for uh, helping and prevent stomach cancers and different intestinal cancers. Um, and then it's a great herb, and I'm sure this is probably one of the more common uses for uh, hypertension, so it actually lowers and lower blood pressure. It's a great herb for the heart. Um, Garlic, and if you kind of think about it, there's a whole doctrine of signature. When you look at a garlic bowl, you know, it almost kind of resembles a heart. You know, the different clothes to the different chambers of the heart. And so that's kind of one, you know, just another way that you can kind of look at it is, you know, evaluating herbs through either, you know, body parts that they resemble or things like that. But garlic is a really, really great circulatory herb, great herb for the heart. Um, and then it's also great for. Um, coughs and colds, runny nose. Uh, one good way that you can prepare it is you can make a syrup out of garlic, which kind of makes it a little more palatable, especially for children. Um, you know, so kind of just at the onset of colds and flu season, you know, you give just a spoonful of garlic syrup. Kids are getting more likely to get that down than, you know, eat, drinking garlic or eating garlic, fresh garlic cloves. Um, but it's a really good way just to kind of help you know, stave off colds and flus. Um, so again, different preparations, the um, ways, of, ways that we can use this is raw. 
I love to just mince up garlic and throw it raw into salads. Um, again, cook with it all the time. Garlic should be in all of our foods. Um, dry, you can dehydrate it and take it as a capsule. It's strong, tastes like garlic, but if you can, you know, stomach it, then great. Uh, you can put it into an oil, you can either do a hot or cold maceration oil. Um, which is another good way to get a lot of the, the especially the circulatory properties are kind of more going to be found in the fresh, or sorry, excuse me, uh, circulatory properties and things like that, hypertension, are going to be more found in kind of the cooked forms of garlic or the prepared forms of garlic where the strong antibacterial properties, antifungal, antiviral, they're going to be found in the fresh garlic. So when you kind of cook the garlic, you're getting rid of a lot of those antiviral, antimicrobial properties. Um, and then you can also take, you can make a garlic tincture, uh, which is just kind of an alcohol extract. Um, and again, those are good for, uh, you know, different circulation issues, circulatory properties. Okay, so our next herb is cayenne. Oh, I'm not going to talk much about it. Hurry up a little bit. Um, cayenne is capsicum frutescence. This is the one that we use um, medicinally. It's in the Solanaceae family, which is the nightshade family. Uh, same family as potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, uh, eggplant, um, other, few other berries, things like that. Tobacco is also in that family. Um, and these, cayenne is native to the tropical Americas. Um, and nowadays it's grown throughout uh, tropical climates, especially in Africa and India. Um, and it prefers kind of a hot, moist conditions. So kind of the, the active constituents that science has looked at are um, capsaicin, uh, it's also really high in carotenoids, which give it a red color, um, flavonoids, uh, which are beneficial for a lot of different kind of body processes in order to boost the and like that. It's also got some volatile oils and then it also has uh, steroidal saponins um, in the seeds only. Um, and again, so it's in the uh, favor of time, I'll skip over a lot of what those are before. Um, actions that we look at is uh, cayenne is one of the strongest stimulating herbs that we have at our disposal. Um, really potent, really strong, really pungent. It's really going to get things moving. Uh, it's a great blood mover. Uh, it also has some carminative properties, so it's going to again, kind of help with gas, bloating, things like that. It's a rubefaciate, so that means it brings blood to the skin. Um, so used topically, it kind of can bring that up. It's also diaphoretic, so it induces sweating. Uh, it's a tonic herb. It has antispasmodic properties, uh, analgesic properties. Uh, it's a strong antiseptic and antifungal. Um, so some of the key uses that we use it for, again, it's just a great circulatory stimulant. Circulatory stimulant. Uh, it's really going to benefit the heart. Um, strengthens the heart, strengthens arteries, capillary beds. Um, as you mentioned earlier, it can stop bleeding, so it's a good styptic. Um, that was actually one of the first uses I ever learned for, for cayenne was um, I got a nosebleed and um, I was working in a restaurant at the time and my chef made a quick cayenne powder and hot water and made me drink it and within about five seconds my nosebleed was gone. Um, so it just stopped it dead in its tracks. Um, uh, it also stimulates digestion. Uh, it's good topically used for psoriasis and rheumatic pains. Um, so again, some different kind of preparations that we can use or different ways that we can use it. We can use it as a poultice. So kind of topically to ease uh, muscle aches, pains, joint pains. Um, it increases blood circulation. It's going to bring blood to that area. And so that's kind of going to be what's going to and, you know, kind of just that improved circulation is going to warm the area and kind of get rid of some of that pain. You can use it as a powder, um, you know, so sprinkle in a little bit of water, like I said, stop bleeding, you can sprinkle it directly into an open wound. It's going to burn, um, but it will, after a minute, it will kind of take away some of the pain and it will also stop bleeding. Um, you can use it as a tincture, and then you're going to drop that tincture in your mouth you're going to wish you hadn't because it's going to burn, but it's, again, a really great circulatory tonic, and it's good internally for arthritis, um, and then also as a digestive stimulant. 
Um, and then you can also make an ointment out of it. So kind of mixing in uh, medicated oil and beeswax, uh, applying that directly to the skin. It's going to get improved the circulation. Um, kind of one contraindication with uh, cayenne is that even in excess, it can cause um, some digestive upset. Um, it can also, if you have peptic ulcers or ulcerations in your GI tract, it can really aggravate that. Um, it's never actually been shown to directly cause peptic ulcers, but if you, again, like you're prone to that, you know, it can increase systemic acidity, um, you know, which is kind of something to avoid if you are prone to those things. So. Uh, the next herb I want to talk about is just common sage, um, which is salvia officinalis. It's in the Lamiaceae family, or the mint family. Um, and salvia is derived from the root word to cure. So again, this is just another herb that's been really highly valued uh, throughout the centuries uh, for its medicinal properties that we, you know, just kind of take for granted. We just don't even think about, you know, all the benefits that we're getting when we cook with sage and these herbs. So the one that you use medicinally is salvia officinalis. Um, there are lots of different varieties of sage, which are all salvia officinalis. There's variegated varieties. Again, um, you might know a lot about this. Um, but there, and then there are thousands, literally thousands of different species of sage. A lot of them are used medicinally. There's a Chinese sage, red sage, uh, salvia militariza, um, which is really big in Chinese medicine. There's, yeah, there's definitely lots of salvias, but the one, the culinary sage we use is um, uh, salvia officinalis. And that's kind of the one that kind of I'm going to focus on, at least for right now. Um, so it's native to the Mediterranean area, and then again, it's cultivated worldwide in sunny conditions. Um, leaves are usually harvested in summer. Um, so it's really high, also in volatile oils, uh, it has ditropine bitters. Uh, again, flavonoids, phenol phenolic acids, and tannins. Um, and all of these things, again, I don't want to go into too in depth because that would just slow us way down on a lot of the ground cover still. Um, but if, again, I teach this class on a pretty regular basis and I go really in depth and you know, quite a bit farther into all of this stuff. Um, so some of the actions, it's astringent, um, so it kind of tightens tissues. Uh, it's antiseptic, um, it's aromatic, carminative, uh, it's oestrogenic, um, it reduces sweating, and it's also a tonic. Uh, so some of the key uses that it's used for is we use it for sore throats, um, uh, amelioration of Alzheimer's disease. So there's, there's some new studies that have been coming out over the last five or so years that are showing that it actually has benefit with when it comes to Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's a good, uh, as far as memory enhancement, um, it can also be beneficial for scanty and irregular menstruation, um, and it also has um, benefits for night sweat because it kind of reduces that sweating, and it has those oestrogenic properties. Um, it's also useful in menopause, also useful in menopause. Um, and so then a couple of the different ways we can prepare sage, one really great way is just the simple infusion. Just a tea, just take a couple of leaves, steep them in some water for a couple of minutes, drink that. Um, as a tincture, it's great as a mouthwash. Um, it can be used to, again, enhance memory. Um, and then also, that's a good way to get it for um, kind of those oestrogenic properties, uh, night sweat, and things like that. And then it's also commonly used in smoking blends. I know there was a lady earlier that asked about um, smoking blends, but. Uh, she asked about smoking blends, I think, in um, earlier class. Yeah, she uses it for, um, like, um, smudge sticks. Smudge sticks, yeah. Yeah, so this is not, this is not white sage, salvia aplana. Uh, the California white sage, which is one commonly used in, um, in smudge sticks and for kind of the more spiritual, traditional uh, ceremonial purposes, I guess. So yeah, this is kind of common culinary sage. Um, this is just green tea, kind of what they had over there. I should have brought my own, but I didn't think about it, so. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, sage is good. 
I kind of actually wanted to bring a big pot and bring some tea, you know, maybe some sage tea or something like that, but I didn't know what the facilities were going to have to offer, so I figured I was better not lug around a big pot and a bunch of herbs to <laughs> make everybody tea that and then mugs. Okay, so the next one was rosemary. Um, so, and this one is rosemary. This is fish analysis, the one that we use medicinally. It's also in the Lamiaceae family. Um, and this has some really great memory enhancing properties. Uh, it's still to this day burned by students in Greece uh, when they go to take their final exams. They'll just kind of burn it uh, in their homes as kind of an incense to get the essential oil um, contents. Uh, so, some of the constituents that we look at, you know, when we're looking at rosemary, are, uh, it's really high in volatile oils, it's got flavonoids, tannins, uh, rosemarinic acid is really great. Valuable compounds, uh, ditropines, and then uh, rosmaricine. Um, some of its key actions that we want to look at and utilize are it's a strong tonic, um, it's also stimulating and has astringent properties. So, again, astringency is something that's going to kind of tighten tissues, torn tissues. Um, it's a great nerving, has anti inflammatory properties. I have analgesic, antibacterial, uh, expectorant, mucolytic, so it kind of increases the mucus production. Um, and it's also antifungal. Again, another really great herb that I could probably teach an entire class just on that one herb. Um, some of its key uses are it's great for improving mental functioning and alertness. Um, actually, just last night I recommended uh, a rosemary essential oil to a friend of mine who's doing a study back east in a uh, Alzheimer's and dementia ward um, and she just wanted to know a few different essential oils that she could use um, to kind of help improve kind of cognitive functioning and ease uh, stress and anxiety that kind of goes along with you know elderly patients as they kind of start to lose their cognitive abilities. Uh, rosemary is great for muscular pain, sciatica, uh, neuralgia, um, it's actually, I read a study um, when I was kind of trying to update these notes that they found that it actually can increase hair growth in patients with alopecia. Um, they found 44% helped 44% of patients um, compared to just 15% of the control groups. Um, uh, it can also um, raise and low blood pressure. So if you suffer from hypertension, you stand up too fast, you get a little lightheaded. Uh, rosemary is a great herb for kind of helping balance that out. Uh, it's good for epilepsy, vertigo, uh, circulatory stimulants. Um, and it's also a great herb for um, just recovering from long-term illness, long-term stress, um, long-term chronic illness. Um, it's just very strengthening. Uh, again, it kind of uh, is... has a strong affinity for the heart, um, and so it can kind of benefit that in other ways. Um, and then it's also good for migraines and mild to moderate depression. Um, so some of the real common, again, uh, preparations are essential oil. Um, I use rosemary essential oil all the time. Um, when I'm taking exams, when I'm studying for exams, all those kinds of things, when I'm trying to focus or concentrate on something, it's really great. Um, and then also the teacher, the rosemary teacher is a really good way to get it, and then uh, as an infusion, again, the rosemary tea, um, just some hot water pour. Sorry, when you were talking about um, heating up and getting disease, would you just smell it before you have it, or? Um, so for those properties, you want to probably want to take it as an infusion or a tincture. Um, and so yeah, just kind of, um, probably just several times a day. Um, Drinking, yeah, just like a rosemary tea. But I mean, I'd probably add it. I would just do this straight simple. But you know, that would be kind of as a, a balanced formula. Um, you know, and then just drinking a tea, you know, a few times a day, kind of throughout the day, kind of for those properties. So, um, let's see. Yeah. Um, so cinnamon is the next herb that I want to talk about. A real popular one. Um, there are a couple of different cinnamon varieties. The one that you'll find most often in your kitchen is uh, 
Cinnamomum aromaticum, uh, which is also um, cassia is one of the common, common terms for it. Um, it's in the Laurelaceae family, or the Laurel family. Um, and it was first, actually not first mentioned, but uh, it goes back even, it was mentioned in the Jewish Torah. Um, cinnamon is native to Sri Lanka, which is an island kind of off the coast of India. In India. Let me, I need to keep my voice hydrated. Um, and so again, some of the constituents that we look at when we look at cinnamon are volatile oils. It's up to 4% of the bark, which is the part we use, we use the inner bark, um, contain uh, essential oils, uh, tannins, coumarins, um, and then also mucilage. So some of the actions that we want to look at or that we look at when we're utilizing cinnamon. Um, cinnamon is another great warming stimulant. Um, it's a really important herb in Chinese medicine. They actually uh, use it for actually bringing people, like people that need to kind of um, do a few more things kind of before they die, they'll give them a real big dose of cinnamon. And it's said to increase or to restore fire at the gate of vitality is kind of the way that they couch that. Um, you know, so it can just kind of kind of prolong your life a little bit at the very end, you know, just so you can finish your will or, you know, those different things that you need to do. Uh, cinnamon is also a great carminative, so again, it kind of helps relieve gas and bloating. Uh, it has antispasmodic properties. It's antiseptic, antiviral, anti-inflammatory, antibacterial. Um, so some of its good uses are improving circulation, nausea and vomiting. Um, it's a diaphoretic, so again, it kind of brings on or can induce sweating. Um, and then it's also good for colds and flu, sinus congestion. Um, and then, as I mentioned, it kind of restores fire to get a vitality. Um, one thing that I hear a lot about is cinnamon's ability to um, reduce blood sugar levels. Um, so this has been evaluated a lot. It's been looked at through numerous different scientific studies, and um, it kind of goes both ways. Some studies say, you know, reduce uh, glucose levels. Some say that it has no effect on it. So I usually, um, since that kind of came about through the scientific community. I don't usually, I've never used it for that. I've never recommended it for that. I'm not saying it doesn't do that, um, but that's just one thing that I'll, I think it's, a lot of people are like, oh, cinnamon, take it for, um, you know, if you're a diabetic or anything like that. And, um, I kind of just kind of, of, I'm of the camp that the jury is still out on that particular topic. Um, just something that I like to bring up because usually when people think of cinnamon used medicinally, that's like the first thing that pops into their mind. But there are so many other really great uses for cinnamon that you know we should remember, and so many that have been you know proven effective that we should kind of focus on. I feel that we should focus more on those than on um, you know something that may or not you know be true. Um, so. Some of uh, uh, the different preparations, again, essential oil is really great. Some essential oil is used for a lot of different things. You do want to make sure that it's diluted. It can be really dermatoxic or dermatitating. Just use meat on the skin. It can cause rashes and things like that. But if you dilute it into another carrier oil, it should be good to go. Um, as a powder, don't do the cinnamon challenge. It's not very smart. It burns. <laughs> Not really all that cool. I've never done it, never want to try. Um, uh, you can use it as a tincture, it's great as a carminative again, you know, just kind of producing gas, bloating. Um, and then just as an infusion, you can use it for colds, flus, um, and then as a warming stimulant. In Chinese medicine, cinnamon is actually the second hottest herb out of all of them, so it's really, really warming. Has anybody ever used any cinnamon essential oil? Yeah, it can be really intense, really intense. It's just really hot, so just kind of be mindful of that if you kind of already run hot, kind of just naturally, um, you know, use, use it mindfully, I guess you could say. Um, so fennel is the next herb that I want to talk about. Um, and its botanical name is Funiculum vulgare. 
It's in the ABACA family or the carrot family. Uh, it's also native to the Mediterranean. Um, and again, it's cultivated worldwide. It grows here really well. Um, during the Middle Ages, it was considered to be an anecdote to witchcraft. So again, you know, this is an herb that has a lot of folklore, a lot of lore around it. Um, a lot of interesting history behind a lot of these herbs. Um, so again, it's really high in lots of oils, uh, flavonoids, coumarins, um, and then also sterols. So it is a great, great digestive herb. So a lot of the actions that are going to be associated with this one, again, it's a good carminative, antispasmodic stimulant, um, rubefacient, uh, which means that it brings blood to the skin. Um, it's aromatic. Uh, it's a galactagogue, so it can actually increase milk production for um, expectant and breastfeeding mothers. Um, and then it's also a good expectorant. So some of its key uses are, again, you know, it uses bloating, um, flatulence, colic, uh, stimulates digestion. Um, it's a good stimulating herb where other herbs can be uh, aggravating. Um, you know, so if, if cinnamon is maybe too intense and you're you know, trying to increase some digestion or even if ginger can be too intense for some people, sometimes if they have a really weak digestive system. Fennel is kind of a more gentle, more cooling, but it still has that kind of overall stimulating uh, ability. Um, and then, as I mentioned just a minute ago, it kind of can promote menstruation and milk production. Um, so the essential oil, fennel essential oil, is really great. Um, it has an affinity with the digestive system. Uh, mental disorders and is also stimulating. Excuse me. Uh, it's great as an infusion, um, as a tincture, and then again, cook with it. Throw it in different dishes. There's probably a million recipes online that you can find. Um, it's big in Italian food. They mix it in with a lot of their sauces and things like that. Um, there's this actually a salami that I love that has fennel seed mixed in with it. Just has a really great kind of easy, yummy flavor. Uh, so thyme, uh, garden thyme is the next herb that I would like to talk about. What was the, was it a salami, did you say? Mm -hmm. what, what is it? Um, it's got some crazy long Italian name. I want to say... Where do you get it? <laughs> um, Caputo's in Salt Lake City. Okay. Yeah. So, um, it's a... Uh, Nocino or something like that. And, um, I don't speak Italian, so don't hold my terrible pronunciation of it, please. Um, so thyme is thymus vulgaris. Uh, it's in the Lamiaceae family or the mint family. Um, and it was praised by uh, herbalist Nicholas Culpepper as, uh, quote, a natural or a notable strengthener of the lungs, as notable as one as grows. Neither is there a better remedy growing for that disease in children, which they call commonly call chin cough, which is um, another nerve or another term for whooping cough. Um, so, thyme is also native to southern Europe, kind of more in the um, kind of Mediterranean climate. Uh, it's cultivated worldwide now. It grows, you can grow up here. Um, it's usually propagated by seeds or root divisions, um, and it kind of prefers a light, chalkier soil. Um, so some of the constituents that we look at with that are, again, just volatile oils, it's really aromatic, it smells really good. Um, most of these cooking herbs and spices, that's going to be kind of the main thing because, you know, I mean, if you take a handful of fresh turmeric or thyme, I mean, it has a really pungent, really great smell. Um, and that's what the volatile oils are, those, those oils that back in um, Also, has high in flavonoids, tannins, uh, triterpenes. Um, some of the actions of Time again, this is a herb with just a crazy long list of actions. So it's antiseptic, tonic, uh, it expels worms, it's an expectorant, it relieves muscle spasms, um, it's antibacterial, antifungal, antimicrobial. Um, they've used the essential oil um, in some different studies and labs, and they've shown that it's actually um, the essential oil of time. Uh, has proven more antibacterial, as strong as a stronger antibacterial than um, a lot of pharmaceutical antibiotics. Um, so again, great. Like you, if you're eating healthy and eating, you know, incorporating a lot of herbs and spices, 
you don't get sick, you know, and if you do get sick, then you use a lot of these things in kind of more concentrated or in different ways, and they will actually work just as good, if not better, than a lot of the pharmaceutical drugs that you can get. Um, it's a great hypertensive um, for lowering uh, blood pressure. It's antiviral, it's a nervine, so it kind of is tonifying and um, helps regenerate, regenerate and rejuvenate to the nervous system. Uh, it's a rubifacia, again, so it kind of brings blood to the skin. Um, and then it also has some stimulating properties. Um, so its antibacterial properties are one of the best ways that we can use thyme. Um, it's immunostimulating, it's antitussive, which means that it uh, kind of reduces cough. Um, it's great for respiratory infections, whooping cough, um, as Nicholas Culpepper mentioned in that quote um, that I mentioned earlier. And it's also great for ringworm, athlete's foot, thrush, which is kind of a uh, bacterial explosion in your mouth. Or not bacterial, I'm sorry, a yeast explosion. Um, and then also uh, different insect bites and stings. It's another great herb for just kind of applying topically straight to those. It kind of takes away the itch, takes away some of the redness and swelling. Uh, different preparations, again, essential oils, really great uses for a lot of the, or for the essential oil for time. Um, it's another oil that you only want to use diluted. It can have some pretty strong, strong uh, dermal irritating uh, qualities. Um, but if you dilute it, you know, down, then it's totally safe to use topically on the skin. Um, uh, infusion, again, just a simple infusion of the leaves is really great. Uh, as a tincture, it's great for, that's, you know, antibacterial, thrush, athletes that you can just use it straight topically, kind of as a liniment, or take it internally, kind of fight the infection from both sides. Um, it's a great syrup, just as a cough syrup. Um, you can mix it with a few other herbs. Um, Colt's foot is a really great herb to use in with um, that. I won't go into that today. It's, it's not something you'll commonly find in your kitchen spice cabinet. But it's still great. Uh, country indications um, you don't want to use this oil, the essential oil, um, when you are pregnant. Um, it can just cause a lot of things, and then again, as I mentioned a minute ago. Um, it can be a dermal irritant. So the next herb is basil. And basil is, again, another one of those uh, plants that there's a lot of different species. Um, which species you use? A lot of the culinary species are all going to be pretty similar. And then there's um, uh, a couple of different species um, that kind of all fall into this one species that eventually got divided into several. Um, awesome and sanctum is holy basil, which has amazing medicinal properties, but you're not really going to use it for cooking so much. It's great to cook with. Um, it's a little spicy, it has a little bit different flavor than the common basil that we use in our kitchen. So kind of for this class, I'm going to stick more to just common kitchen basil, which is, um, again, tons of different species. There's ground uh, florian and lots of different know, lots of different um, anyways, also in the Lemiaceae family, or the mint family. The reason I mention families is um, a lot of herbs in similar families, you can kind of look at the herbs in those families and, and kind of judge safety um, wise. You mentioned the coniums or hemlocks, they're in the carrot family, and there's a lot of uh, herbs and different plants in the carrot family that are kind of borderline toxic or highly poisonous. Um, there's also some good ones. Mint family, you pretty much can assume that most of the mints are going to be generally safe, um, used kind of in a normal, normal way. Um, so it is, it is good to know plant families. Um, basil is native to India um, and other tropical regions of Asia. That's extensively cultivated now, um, pretty much throughout the world, but also a rural um, in Central and South America. Um, and then, as I mentioned, it's a real close relative of Osmum Sanctum, which is holy basil, which, again, um, you can grow it around here. It's an amazing medicinal. Um, there's a ton of research done on it. It's been used in India for thousands of years. 
It's actually next to the lotus flower. It's like their second most holy or most revered quote um, there. Again, so constituents we're looking at are volatile oils, flavonoids, triterpenes. Um, it's actions it has it's antispasmodic, analgesic, it can lower blood pressure, so it's hypertensive. Um, this actually, well, the holy basil um, has been shown to lower blood sugar levels. Um, that's also an adaptogenic herb, so it helps your body deal with stress. Um, uh, it's an anti-inflammatory, it reduces fever, it's carminative. Um, and then some of the key uses, again, the, uh, um, the holy basil, great herb for just adrenal fatigue. If you deal with a lot of stress in your life, or if you're kind of worn out, run down, all the time, holy basil is, I can't speak highly enough of that word. It's uh, fantastic. Working yet? Um, I offer it through my apothecary. You can also grow it. Um, it's great, just fresh. Like I said, it's kind of, it's a little spicier than just common, um, like sweet basil and things like that. Um, but it's just a great herb to grow and grow around here really easily. Um, and then, yeah, there's. So they're all awesome species. Um, Thai basil, I can't remember the, the technical name on that one. I can't think of it right off the top of my head. Um, that would be more kind of, I would consider that to be more akin to just common, common culinary basil. Um, holy basil, there's three different identified species. Um, awesome tenifolium. I'm not gonna remember the other two right off the top of my head. Um, but they're all kind of real closely related. And they all have just these really amazing medicine properties. Um, so yeah, adrenal fatigue, um, anxiety, depression, insomnia, epilepsy, migraines, whooping cough. Um, these are all good uses of just regular common table basil. Um, and then different preparations, the juice, and actually the juice basil is really good. Um, as an infusion, dry is great. Um, and then also, Take it as a dried powder or encapsulate it, um, and take it as, as capsules that way. Um, so the last one I'll talk about, since we're doing over time, is clove, um, which is Cigium aromaticum, and that's in the myrtle family. And this is actually one of the earliest spices traded. Um, it's a great preservative. That's kind of one of the reasons, as I mentioned at the very start of the class, one of the reasons that people kind of started using a lot of these different spices to still preserve food before refrigeration. Um, and uh, so it's also native to Indonesia and the South Philippines. Um, and that's now primarily cultivated in Tanzania, Tanzania, which is in Africa, and then also Madagascar, which is kind of the big island off of Southern Africa. And again, so we're looking in clove, we're looking at the different volatile oils, gums, uh, tannins, and then its actions are uh, it's antiseptic, it's carminative, uh, stimulant, analgesic, and antispasmodic, and it can also eliminate uh, parasites. So some of the different ways that we can use clove, um, analgesic properties, I'm sure a lot of you may have heard of, you know, if you have a toothache, apply a little bit of clove essential oil, you know, it can really take rid of the pain right there. Um, it's, Antibacterial properties, you can use clove oil, diffuse it throughout your home, and it's a great way to use it. And then also just as a tea, and then again, cook with it. You know, it's great just to cook with all of these herbs. Um, and so, about two things. What's that? It's great for two yeah, things. yeah, the essential oil. Um, and so, kind of maybe the, you know, I just this is a ton of information. I'm sorry if I went fast or you guys were here. But I think the thing that I'd like to impart to all of you guys the most is, is really, you know, don't differentiate between food and medicine. Food is medicine and medicine is food. You know, and so if you're using these things on a daily basis, you know, and if you get used to using these things on a daily basis, you're going to, I mean, it's, you'll notice that your health is going to improve. Uh, you're going to feel better, your mood will improve, 
you know, and so these are all benefits that we can get just from right in your own kitchen, you know. I'm sure probably all of you, if you do any kind of cooking, you're going to be able to just open up your kitchen cabinet and probably a lot of these are just going to be found right there, you know. And so don't think of medicine as something that, oh, I have to go to the doctor or I have to, you know, I have to give up my, um, you know, my uh, ability to heal myself or, you know, give away the responsibility for your health because ultimately we are responsible for our own health, um, you know, and if you take charge of your own health, you're going to find that you're going to do much better um, and be healthier and happier. Any questions? Big one. Yeah. What is the difference though? Because I was raised by an Asian mother, raised in Vietnam, cooking Chinese, Vietnamese, then moved to the French Bear, where all these Mediterranean herbs, everything we eat. So we always grew it. We always had things like this all my life. Mm -hmm. California is much easier. Here in Utah, I have to grow them in my greenhouse, but I can't grow shapes all these. Things. I have to have them all the time. Um, what is the difference though if I go buy, say, certified organic? Or if I go buy the Chinese market, which they have some sort of organic and very surprising 500 less than Provo. Mm -hmm. But what is the difference as far as what's going to be best for me? Of course, the fresh I'm growing in my greenhouse, uh -huh. right? But if you were to buy these, because you go to some of these people at Sprouts Market that are Dr. Christopher's, and they swear by, no, you must get these pure forms only, otherwise they won't be any good. Just like the essential oil people. Oh, you have to get doTERRA. They're the only one on the planet that has essential oils that are pure. You know, it's kind of frustrating to hear all this marketing in America yeah. when I was raised by just keep it simple, fresh, grow well, it. I think, I think the best way, obviously, if you, can, if you can, if you have the ability to grow them, grow them, especially with a lot of these herbs, the, you know, the primary active components of these herbs are the volatile oils that when you dry them, you know, those diminish a lot of the vitamins, vitamin C, you know, I mean, the minute you pick vegetables, the vitamin C content drops dramatically. You know, so obviously if you can do it fresh, if you can grow organic, that's great. Um, if you can't, which a lot of us can't, you know, we live in apartments or things like that, um, and so it's just not possible to do that. Um, it is hard to cut through all the marketing. Um, usually, kind of just my own personal choice. If somebody's really trying to push something on me, then I almost feel that they have something, not necessarily to hide, but they're trying, they're pushing so hard, you know, I believe that if it's a good product, it will sell itself. And so, um, you know, I do things just through recommendation. The herbs I buy, I buy, you know, I buy certified organic. If I can wildcraft them, I do, you know, as long as it's, um, if, as long as I'm ethically well crafting um, nettles were mentioned in the earlier class. Nettles are an amazing spring tonic that you can just go up in the valleys like stream banks and things like that and find them. You know, as long as it's not close to the roadside, you know that it's probably not sprayed. You know, perfect straight from nature. Um, and so as far as different companies, I, I don't like to necessarily, I mean if you come, you know, I definitely have the companies that I trust. Um, I've worked in the natural products industry for a long time, so I evaluate all the products that I use and dispense out of my health care. Um, um, I was just going to say, one of the things I found really was going to try to get through all that, so, again, that information is within yourself. So if you could start to discern the vibrational activity of the product itself, or the, like I just practice, if I'm in the grocery store with a pile of apples, say to yourself, every single one of these apples is different. And you're going to choose now a lot of that many of my Just raise your hand, use yourself, and use your intention to pick up the apple for yourself. Because it's self resonance levels. It's on the molecular level. You can't skip away from that. Again, it's just going to come on you. So you can use your own intuition to, to make your choices. You're going to have to come and touch that on the side. That's an excellent answer. <laughs> So in all the in all the herbs, is 
draw the best, the best and so it kind of depends on what what you're trying to achieve, I guess, maybe. Um, for a lot of it, raw would be... I get, would the word be more pure? Well... Like fresh, and more out of the garden. Yeah. Dry it, you know where it came from. I mean, pure is dry, yeah. I, you know, fresh ginger to dry ginger, they have different properties. Um, a lot of them have crossover, they're both warming, they're both stimulating. But dry ginger is going to be far more warming, far more stimulating. Fresh ginger is going to be, you know, more, it regulates the chi better, it's going to be kind of more for indigestion, things like that. Um, so pure, maybe not necessarily, I don't know, I think you're kind of asking so, fresh versus dry, maybe, is that kind of what you're... Yeah, or, yeah, or the, yeah, or the like brown. Yeah. 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 Um, whole is always better, you know, once you grind things up, it's going to start to oxidize. You know, you're going to lose a lot of the volatile oils, a lot of the, you know, vitamins, minerals, flavonoids, and things like that. Do you have any ideas? Because, like, these Chinese people keep these herbs forever. So, obviously, they don't have a shelf life. Uh, herbs do somewhat. Some herbs, some Chinese herbs. Um, tangerine peel, for instance. The more it's aged, actually, the better it is. So it's, again, it kind of just goes to what you're trying to use it for. Um, because drying herbs, cooking herbs, putting it into tincture, putting it into oil, it's all going to kind of change the, the energetics of it. As you know, a little bit in the back was talking about, it's going to change um, kind of just different uses. You know, if you, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. So it's not just like, um you know, eating whole foods. It's better to eat it raw than if you eat it cooked because you lose um, the enzymes and nutrients. But Some with the herbs, it's not yeah. completely that way. You it, still well, it get, is. So it even, is, but you still get benefits. Even, even with cooking things, uh -huh. um, a lot of nutrition isn't unlocked until you cook something. Yeah, and so, so asparagus is that way. It's actually yeah. healthier to cook asparagus than it is. Yeah, broccoli, for instance. Um, broccoli is slightly toxic raw. It's actually better to cook it, you know, brass cases. What about kale? Kale, again. But yeah. We okay. could pick Nick's brain forever. But yeah. If we can thank Nick, and then if you guys have some questions, that would be great. So. Yeah. He's got actually, some cards, cards here. Up here. So thank you, Nick. Thank you guys for coming.